Alright, now that we've listened to a couple of examples, let's go into creating a radio drama. So what do you have to do? Well, you need a script. That could mean writing a new script or adapting another work, like a stage play or a book. Now, whatever you decide to do, the, um, the script style in general is going to be very similar to a traditional play. The difference, of course, being you aren't going to have any stage directions for people that relate to being upstage or downstage. Instead, we are focusing more on sound effects, dialogue, and music cues. So you want to maybe include where people are in relation to each other, but it's going to happen more in the recording and editing process as opposed to in the visual realm like it does whenever we're talking about a traditional play. Now, when you develop a script, of course, it needs to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Whenever you watch a TV show, pretty much any TV show, documentaries included in there, you will notice that there is usually some kind of introduction where you are learning about the characters or you are learning about the plot, whatever it is that's going on. What is it that you want your audience to know? What's going to happen? What are you introducing to them conflict-wise that they will then see in an eventual resolution of some type. Um, now you'll notice, especially for timed shows, so ones that run on traditional schedules for TV or radio, there are the beginning, middle, and end are even clearer. So if you watch an episode, let's say, of the TV show House, House was a show where the main character, House, was, um, he would diagnose different weird diseases or issues that people were having or whatever, and he would figure out a way to help them. And usually what would happen is you would have the kind of introduction to the day at the beginning, and then you would have the part where th there's, um, where you learn about the person or the issue, whatever it is that's going on in the first 15 minutes, second 15, you have a, a continuation of it. Um, then at that 30 minute mark, there's going to be some kind of twist that happens. And then at the 45 minute mark um, is when we start seeing uh, maybe a a lot of times it, it was some kind of fake resolution. So we think we have the answer um, in that like third 15 minute segment, but we don't quite. And then, or uh, yeah, 15 to 20 minutes. And then in the final 10 to 15 minutes, you'll have the real resolution where they say, oh no, that wasn't the problem. It's this other thing. So when you're developing your scripts, no matter how long it is or whatever time frame you're working with, um, you're going to have some version of that development happening. So you want to kind of plot out some basic points of what's going on. And if you uh, are working in a limited time frame, make sure you keep that in mind. Like, okay, how many of these details can we really include from the original? If you're, let's say, adapting a book, how much of this can we include and stay, or how much can we, uh, do we need to leave out in order to fit our time frame or to make it work better for this audio format? Now, when you're writing your plot, think about what do you want to happen. So what kind of conflict is being resolved or what type of resolution is happening? It could be a resolution of no resolution where things go back to the way they were at the beginning and after the conflict happens and or they just continue being the same, but not the same. Um, 
So usually there's some kind of movement that's going on, even if it isn't the traditional conflict resolution type of situation. Now, you have, um, you also, as you heard in our examples, you have some kind of action going on usually, and also a combination of dialogue and narration. And all three of those things, action, dialogue, and narration, are used to advance the plot and help your audience follow along and figure out what's happening. And you want to provide details in a logical way, otherwise known as exposition. You are developing your information in a way that can be understood by your audience. So if you are describing a character, for example, um, like with the in the case of the War of the Worlds script, whenever you listen to it, you can tell that Okay, we have people who are on Earth. They are observing things that are happening around them. And the things they are observing are things that these people in real life would be able to observe and understand. Now, when you're developing your script, one of the ways that you can create action without your audience being able to see who's there is through sound. And some of the ways that you will develop your sounds will be kind of natural ones in the studio and others might rely on what are called Foley techniques. Uh, this is These are sound effects that are created to mimic or enhance real life sounds. And this is named after the American sound technician, Jack D. Foley. And these types of sounds can be used to emphasize dialogue whenever the audience isn't able to view what's happening. Now, let's watch this interview with this woman who creates the God of War sound effects. She uh, she goes through the process showing some of the, the techniques and the tools that she uses and explains why different things might uh, vary depending on the genre of the video game or the, the show that she's she's working for. All right. So hopefully that uh, that gave you some ideas about different things that you can use and uh, yeah, gives you a, a little more insight into some of the uh, the movies and video games and other things that you can do to add on to your um, your audio projects. Now, of course, the other aspect of audio storytelling is including dialogue and narration. Now, when we talk about dialogue and narration, these can be in the same uh, the same piece where you have a main character who is also the narrator. But often what happens, uh, especially with some of the older stories too, is they'll have the dialogue, and then in addition to the dialogue, they'll also have a narrator who is describing what's happening uh, in each scene or explaining some things that you might not see or maybe you wouldn't completely understand without an explanation, even if even with the addition of audio, other uh, sound elements and music and things. So whenever you're developing dialogue, remember that your audience can't see people. So they need to hear what's happening through your actor's inflection of a line. Um, they have a, a few shows. Um, one that, that comes to mind first is uh, the original show, Frasier. They had several episodes where someone would just say one word and the way each character said it explained their relationship to what was going on in the scene. And it's those kinds of details that can really add to audio storytelling. Um, 
but also of course what the the people are saying so what's actually in the the dialogue or if it's someone by themselves what are they saying so when we talk about dialogue remember this is going to help your audience learn about each character and how they relate to the world and the other characters and this might include, um, whenever we're talking about narration, we might have, again, that external narrator that's um, kind of out of the picture, looking down along with the audience on to the rest of the scene. Um, or it could be someone who is a character in the story. For example, if we're talking about a ring announcer who's describing a boxing match, they are able to describe what's going on. Or... Whenever we listen to War of the Worlds, whenever you hear someone who is one of the scientists and they're describing what they saw through their telescope or what they're seeing in their readings and what does that mean for the audience or when there was that uh, clock sound, what was the clock sound? What did it relate to? And that can help your audience pick up on what's going on and improve your storytelling. Now, here's another uh, video game narrator example. It uh, It's from the uh, the game Hades 2, where they're, um, it, it's both the first Hades and the second one have this unknown narrator who's speaking. Uh, of course, in the second one, you find out who it is, but they'll... Um, yeah, you'll get to see them interact with the characters in this case, which adds a, a different perspective for the narrator. Whenever the narrator is either someone looking back on their life, or in this case, it's someone who is technically outside of the action, but they're still acknowledged and interacting with the main character. Within the haunted crossroads reside shades and spirits of all sorts, some resembling their mortal selves, and others rendered down to purest essences. You all right, Homer? Nay. And of course, that was a, a very short clip, but you get the idea. He goes in and describes the scene in addition to the audience being able to see it and is also a connection with the audience and with the main character of the story. So after you write your script, you need to cast the people who will be in it, rehearse and perform. Yay. Um, so you want to review your script with your the people who are going to be involved. Are you going to, and this is where you, if you're working with a budget to, you might say, okay, well, how many people can I afford to have? And you'll see this a lot with animated shows too, where you look and there are one or two people on the show who have 60 or 70 voice credits. And it's because of budgetary reasons and also because they're, they're great voice actors. They're able to play all of these parts and make them believable characters in each instance. So uh, whenever you're casting and rehearsing, figure out what you need. Um, what kind of people do you need to make your, your work come alive and of course, figure out things like, are you, do you have one person who can play multiple parts? Um, are they sounding too similar for those? Or are the characters coming up too close to each other where even in editing, it might be a little awkward. Um, one of the tricks you can use whenever you're, whenever you're recording, if you have one person who's playing multiple parts and the parts are right next to each other, if it's too hard for them to switch between the different voices, you can always have someone who is kind of the, the dummy reader for them to react off of. So someone who won't be in the final take, but they're saying the other lines for them to help 
so whatever the other part is, like if they're having a conversation with themselves and they need someone to react off of, then you might include a, uh, a person there to read the lines and help them figure out the spacing for when different things need to happen. Now, some people are totally fine playing two or three parts all at once, uh, not like at the same time, but one after the other. So really depends on who you have. Um, and this is also where you'll figure out if you have any trouble spots in the script. And this is something that happens too whenever you are making scripts for advertisements or for traditional news even. Whenever you read it out loud and you're working out the language, that's where you can figure out like, okay, this maybe this piece of information needs to be in a different spot because um, it doesn't really make sense here. Or maybe you um, you have parts that would sound better if you move a couple of them around. And don't be afraid to move them around. Sometimes you need to edit and revise things. And another thing, whenever you're rehearsing, you um, and you might want to record multiple takes. So record the same lines a few times uh, after, you know, everyone gets used to, to speaking and, and saying their lines and everything. And make sure that you label your tracks and your recordings, and that'll help you whenever you have to put everything together. And you can say, okay, yeah, I, I noted that track five was the best take. So make sure that you have it labeled that way in your system too. Now, another thing that kind of starts back when you're recording is developing the illusion of movement. And you kind of saw it with the, uh, the Foley people, but depending on how close or far away you are to the microphone, um, it's going to change how the audio records too. Um, now, of course, you might you can always go in while you're editing and make audio softer or louder or change it from mono to stereo or anything like that when you're recording it. So uh, whenever you have characters who are moving around, especially, you can use that like having them only in the left channel for a minute and then only having them in the right channel the next minute. And that will give your audience the illusion of space. And of course, if we're working outside of stereo and into something where we have like five or six speakers, that will change it too. But in here, for the most part, we're, uh, you know, we have two speakers left and right. And so you would move between those two. And then you also want to think about how your characters perceive the sounds and other characters. Remember that you're, when you're working in a radio drama, you're trying to create something that no matter how far-fetched it is, that it works in the realm of reality. So even if you have like unicorns or something, then you want people to react to the unicorn like they would in this world that you've developed. So if it's something that's commonplace, then they would, you know, be they wouldn't be that surprised or if it's something unusual then they might notice that it's a little different or they might comment on it looking similar to something else that does exist more in a more common sense in their world so uh those are also kind of tied into script writing too but you know if you Whenever you're editing, if you have characters who might be scared and run away from something, then you might have the sound they're running away from in the left side and the characters moving from the left to the right speaker. And of course, whenever you're recording and editing, you want to make sure that you're using the appropriate soundproofing. So using those soundproof booths in, in the audio annex and also uh, consider different recording 
using different recording techniques or if you have them some uh maybe some different microphones or different locations like if you want an echo um usually what people do whenever you're you're recording is you'll record the kind of normal track and then you'll go and add an echo in uh in production so whenever you go to your list of sound effects you would use that and that way you could pick the best echo for it. Um, another way to do it is to record in a bathroom. Bathrooms generally have a lot of tile in them or metal, and even in a small space, they can still give you a pretty good uh, echo effect in a natural environment. And uh, another thing, whenever you're deciding like, okay, do I need to have reverb or not or echo or not, then you um, you want to consider the space that you're working in. Like in, in your script, where does it say you are? Are you outside somewhere? Well, if you're outside in the open, the open like outside area, not next to a building is going to have it isn't going to have echo because the sound is just going to keep traveling. It isn't going to bounce back off of anything. So you want to reflect that in your recording. Or if your person is trapped in a, a kitchen or something, then it's going to have more reverb than if they're um, than if they're outside, but less than if they're in like a cathedral or something. So keep those things in mind whenever you're recording and editing. Now, one last thing, um, where can you find archived radio dramas to help you get some ideas? You can go to Relic Radio. They have some available for free on there. There are, of course, a lot of other places where you can find them. Um, I think they even have some of the older ones up on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and stuff now, too. And, of course, as we saw, uh, some of them are archived on YouTube as well. Okay, well, that is it for your lesson on radio and radio dramas. Good luck, and let me know if you have any questions. <laughs>